Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about a very early stage work in progress that I'm calling Trucking and Rail, Coopetition in Intermodal Freight Traffic. Um, trucking and rail have historically been competitors within the larger shipping industries, um, whether they competed in the marketplace or in the regulatory arena by lobby, lobbying various legislative bombs at each other or in the antitrust area. Uh, container shipping um, traffic uh, really complicated that relationship, leading to closer interaction between the two modes, as well as a possibility of spillovers between the rail and trucking industries. Um, for the most part, Economic analysis has not yet accounted for this more complicated relationship, um, and I intend uh, in this project to look at the impact of investments in one or other of these industries on the other industry of its competitor. Um, so, oh, right. There. So each of these industries comes with its own benefits as they differentiate each other from each other in the marketplace. For instance, once, the rail, once a railroad is established, there's a lower per car fuel and labor co costs associated with shipping, um, whereas trucking has a flexibility to ship goods wherever there is a road, and trucking companies don't need to wait or invest uh, time or money into building its own roads. Uh, this historically gave trucking a competitive edge for shorter distances, while rail was preferred for longer distances. Um, Back in 1990, uh, the Department of Transportation assessed that there was a sort of division in the marketplace where trucking had a competitive advantage under 725 miles, um, and that rail, uh, as long as it was double stack rail service on a dense traffic corridor, could be competitive with trucking um, over that 725 mile marker. Um, more recently, however, uh, the Department of Transportation has indicated that rail traffic can be competitive over shorter distances for a variety of goods. And as innovation has come along uh, and competition grew, uh, there is a new factor of intermodal traffic um, where, say, a truck delivers goods to a railroad, uh, possibly up to 100 miles, then the railroad will transport uh, goods, say, across the country, and then trucks take back the service for last mile delivery or the secondary drayage portion of the route. Um, this factor of intermodal traffic uh, requires coordination between the two modes or multiple modes, um, and it's no longer necessarily a clear competitive relationship. Um, the uh, trucking and the rail industries need to cooperate to provide this enhanced service for the end user while still competing for profit uh, from providing the enhanced service. Um, early methods of intermodal shipping involved truck trailers riding piggyback along rail flat cars held in place with chains and binders and screw jacks. It required a tremendous amount of labor and time uh, to secure these uh, trailers uh, to the rail flat cars. Um, various advances in piggybacking technology, um, including collapsible screw hitches, which allowed uh, essentially bolts to sort of just hold containers in place uh, once they were on rail flat cars, greatly reduced the labor needs for unloading and loading. Um, and then further, of course, uh, containers um, led to a more efficient mode of bulk shipping, uh, double stacking in particular as railroads um, began to invest in corridors that could accommodate uh, double stack trains by um, rebuilding in some cases bridges or tunnels to accommodate the extra clearance. Um, also further refined container shipping and also, uh, similar to Hayu's note of gauge transfer issues, uh, container sizes weren't, didn't used to be standardized, um, but for the most part, they now are, leading to an easy last mile delivery where a container can be put onto a rail flatbed, or a truck flatbed, and sent off to its final destination. Uh, with these technology advances, it's hardly surprising how much intermodal traffic has grown on rail. Uh, 
it was only accounted for about 3 million uh, containers or trailers back in 1980. That's grown to nearly 14 million in the last year. Um, also, container traffic has taken over and accounted for the bulk of that growth as trailers are becoming less and less used. Um, surprisingly, um, despite this emergence of a cooperative venture in intermodal traffic, the study of economic activity in trucking and rail has remained squarely within those respective industries. For instance, uh, productivity, cost, pricing studies are generally performed as a function of industry-specific variables, such as traffic composition, or the presence of regulation, or the impact of deregulation, a number of those studies being performed by people in this room. Um, those that have begun to look at the industries together have mostly focused on feasibility studies or uh, demand side analyses, um, as well as competitive issues facing the intermodal traffic itself. Um, they haven't necessarily considered the impact that, say, innovations or development or investment in one or these industries might have on the other. Um, and that brings me to my focus of research, um, which is looking at the spillover effects of investments in either the freight rail or trucking transportation industries on the other. Um, specifically, I'm curious whether investments in the trucking industry primarily benefit trucking or whether they promote transportation infrastructure in general to the effect of the rail industry being able to enjoy increased productivity or decreased cost, decreased prices, et cetera, and vice versa. Um, for my first stage of analysis, I'm intending to look at the rail industry specifically and whether costs in the rail industry react to investment in the trucking industry. Um, and uh, what do I mean by investment in the trucking industry? Um, for now, I'm, as this is an early stage project, I'm exclusively looking at private sector investment. Um, once I have a proof of concept in the private sector, I might see expanding the research question to include public investment in, say, roads. Um, but uh, to start my analysis, I intend to look at firm level data on rail and the impact of trucking investment. I'll be using a translog cost function, which is a second order approximation of costs that's commonly found in the literature. Um, I'll use uh, firm level data for rail uh, in an unbalanced panel. Um, there is no relevant cross section for trucking, um, so it will vary only across years, uh, not just not firms of rail, for obvious reasons. Um, here is the equation, which also had a few issues in going through, so sorry about that. But it was complicated enough to look at anyway, so you probably appreciate this. Uh, you can just sort of look up a little bit higher at the C equals C, and then parentheses, P, Y, T, in T. Um, that's the base model. Um, essentially, the variables include a vector of factor prices, a vector of outputs, a vector of technological attributes, um, a time trend variable, and then my key variable of interest, uh, investment in the other industry. Um, I also include a number of interaction terms, uh, interacting output and input variables. Um, as far as data is concerned, I'll rely on the annual financial reports collected by the Service Transportation Board available in the R1 database. Um, this includes a wealth of variables and data on class one railroads. Um, for instance, as just in factor prices, uh, they collect uh, information on labor prices, fuel prices, materials and supplies, ways and structures, um, all annually from the various class one railroad firms. Um, there are a number of other variables not included on this slide. This is just to give you a picture of uh, what can be included in the model. Um, as far as the trucking investment data are concerned, um, I will rely for now on a survey conducted annually by the US Census Bureau. It provides an aggregate measure for annual private firm investment, and it's broken out into investment in structures as well as investment in equipment. Um, 
here is a sort of brief overview of what that investment data look like, um, the, those investment data look like. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, John. Um, the, they also collect information on rail. And so I've got the two industries uh, overlaid next to each other on the same scale. As you can see, they fairly closely match each other in terms of overall investment over the years. But trucking, which is the blue, not the gray, uh, is a lot more volatile than, say, the rail expenditures. Um, as we drill down into the um, differences in how they approach their annual expenditures in investment, uh, rail tends to invest roughly a third of their annu annual expenditures toward equipment and two thirds toward structures, whereas rail, uh, trucking, for well obvious reasons, and that they don't have to build roads, uh, invests uh, more on an average of 95% towards equipment. Um, I imagine that, or hope that that uh, ref variation in the five to 10 percentile of investment toward structures on the private side might lead to interesting conclusions later. Um, but uh, that's roughly, huh? roughly where I am right now. Um, as far as my progress on this project, um, I need to finish cleaning the R1 data so that I can start running the regressions of my model, um, at which point I will examine what I assume and hope might be a reduction in rail costs associated with trucking investment. Um, at that point, I would also be interested in incorporating, uh, if possible, a more granular level of private trucking investment data or um, potentially investment data in ports or other things that would contribute to intermodal terminals or hubs and those transfer points. Um, and with that, uh, I will open up my project to discussion. I hope that you might have feedback for me because as you can see, this is a very early stage project, so it's plenty of room to shape it going on. Thank you. Hi, Kevin Neal from the Brattle Group. One thing I'd be, might be worth looking into is equipment cycles and some of these investments. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the different types of, of equipment have di very different useful lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Rolling stock can remain in use for decades. Trucks, I think, are turned over much more quickly. Yeah. And some of the volatility you see in the truck investment may be related to, you know, various cohorts of old investment mm -hmm. wearing out over time. So I just I think suggest some that of the volatility also had to do with uh, just the recession back in you know, the recession. There's mm -hmm. also, and actually with trucks, there's changes in admission standards too. Mm -hmm. But but thinking about the useful lifetime may may help you to bring that into focus. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think you might also be able to uh, find a lot of really useful information in the reverse direction of the railroad investment, um, mm -hmm. specifically in things like uh, they use a lot of auto racks and they have to build special, por uh, special ramps so that they can drive the cars on and off, mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as improvement in um, ship to rail at ports like those, those investments are either taken by the port or by the rail, but, but significantly improve the cost to the shipper. And that's gonna probably, and then just also as, as proof of the idea, um, the largest, um, the majority of the container traffic on rails is actually being uh, paid for by shipping company, by trucking mm -hmm. companies. Right. You know, by those conglomerate, JB Hunt, Swift, all these people, they are by far the, the biggest um, customers of intermodal traffic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, yeah, James Nolan, U.S. Amanda, I'm not sure if this is gonna help too much, but I, and I don't know the U.S. experience, but in Canada, when CN was a publicly operated railway back in the 80s and 90s, they actually tried to run their own trucking fleet and it failed. Mm -hmm. and it dropped away, and I might be able to find you some references to that. They might not be in big journals, but they've probably shown up in conferences, this sort of thing, right? Just to let you know that 
it's been tried, at least in Canada, and the publicness of the firm may have something to do with that, but it was tried and it failed. And that, maybe that's something to sort of lead in with and say, you know, th this, this won't be the future or will or whatever you want to take it with. So just let you know it's, it's been tried in the, in the rail sector to integrate like that. So. Thanks, James. And really I don't know experiences that. in the U.S. and it wants to kick in and say, has any U.S. railway tried to integrate trucking into their operations as part of, you know, named, a named operator? They all did at one point. They all failed. It's the same thing. So there we go. So I didn't know the US experience. They all failed. So thank you, Amanda. I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about this kind of um, complementor competitor kind mm -hmm. of aspect of this interaction uh, would be ultimately kind of thinking through the welfare effects. Because you might imagine, for instance, that if a trucking company anticipates that it's, or trucking companies anticipate that they're going to lower rail costs, knowing that they're going to be competitors for traffic, Mm -hmm. Does that lead then them to hang back and not invest as much as they would have if they had been kind of separate? And so I think there's some very, very interesting welfare implications in the work that you're doing. And I'm wondering if you've been thinking about those or whether the, whether the cost function approach lends itself to that or whether you may need to go in a somewhat complementary direction uh, <laughs> to get at those I I... and the welfare effects. I've been thinking about how to chip away at this issue from multiple angles. The, the translog cost function just seems like a very good place to start, um, but it's a very good area to continue to grow in. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, expanding on the uh, uh, point the gentleman made about Canada, in the United States, it used to be that the railroads did in fact own motor carriers and uh, certainly before 1980 and to a certain extent after 1980 when the Motor Carrier Act passed, mm -hmm. you needed the railroad-owned motor carriers in order to get ICC authority. Their, um, their certificates of public convenience and necessity would often limit the railroad-owned motor carriers to carrying freight only if there was a prior or subsequent rail movement so mm -hmm. they might have empty halls. Now, over time that degree of regulation of the motor carrier industry certainly declined in 1980, but it continued to a certain extent and then went away, what, in the mid-90s. Um, so you should be aware of that regulatory overlay mm -hmm. that, that would affect the, the cost structure of the industry. Since that time, the, the most notable example I'm aware of of railroads trying to come up with synergy by owning a motor carrier mm -hmm. was Union Pacific acquiring overnight, which was then the largest LTL um, non-union motor carrier, and it never it never gelled. It didn't work, and and we sold that you know ultimately. So it has been tried, and it hasn't worked. Uh, so, Amanda, two things. Uh, first, uh, that translog had about 20 or 30 right-hand side variables, and I think there are six or eight railroads left in the U.S. right now. So, that's going to be a yeah. that's going to be an issue for you <laughs> when you're trying to estimate <laughs> estimate that. But back to uh, David's point about welfare, it, it reminds me that there was a uh, there was a TRB report, gosh, maybe five or ten years ago, and I think it was TRB 246, but that's a guess. And they, they actually did a comparison of if you move something by rail from mm -hmm. here to there, and they actually use specific moves, and then if you move it by intermodal from here to there, or if you move it by truck from here to there. And going back to, to your introduction this morning, what was it, the, the uh, $2 change in the price of fuel led to this 15% decline? or is associated with this 15% decline in intermodal, that's interesting, okay? Yeah. And, and so- That's so, the U paper? Uh, this is what John it's was- you, yeah, that one. Yeah, so, so sort of picking up on the welfare effects mm -hmm. of things moving by intermodal versus moving solely by truck, mm -hmm. I think would be a very interesting dimension of, the, of, the, uh, of this research. Thank you, Professor McCullough. Thanks, Jeff.